Hello, and welcome to the Capitola uh, Special Planning Commission meeting. This meeting is open to the public with both in-person attendance at the City of Capitola Council Chambers at 420 Capitola Avenue, and remote viewing is also possible. The Planning Commission and staff are attending in person, and members of the public wanting to offer public comment need to be present. The public can live stream the meeting on the city's website, on YouTube, or on Zoom following the link on the meeting agenda. As always, this meeting is cablecast live on Spectrum Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and AT&T U-verse Channel 99, and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Mondays and Fridays at 1 p.m. on Spectrum Channel 71 and Spectrum Channel 25. A, a recording of the meeting will also be available on the city's website after the meeting. Our technician tonight is T, and as a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting. Thank you. All right. Um, roll call. Pledge of Allegiance or Pledge of Allegiance. Let's do Pledge of Allegiance. Roll call. Real thanks. Commissioner SD. Here. Commissioner Westman. Here. Commissioner Wilk. Here. Vice Chair Jensen. Here. And Chair Christensen. Here. And then Pledge of Allegiance. Item two, additions and deletions to the agenda. Yes, staff did receive additional materials for tonight's item 5A. This was three public comment letters and one staff email. These have all been added to the agenda packet and distributed to the public. Um, and they're available in the back of the room as well. Thank you. Uh, oral communications for item three. Oral communications allows time for members of the public to address the Planning Commission on any consent item on today's agenda on any topic within the jurisdiction of the city that is not on the public hearing section of the agenda. Members of the public may speak for up to three minutes unless otherwise specified by the chair. Individuals may not speak for more, more than once during oral communications. All speakers must address the entire legislative body and will not be permitted to engage in dialogue. Maximum of 30 minutes is set aside for oral communications. We don't have a consent, anything on the consent calendar? Or I'm sorry, oral communications, is there anybody? Hi. My name is Joe Heller. I'm here in regards to a code case violation for my retail store. Um, is it appropriate time to bring this up? Um, can I um, submit a few exhibits, uh, some photographs that I've taken regarding this to the uh, council, please? Is that permitted? Sure. Oh, sure. Uh, six copies of documents. So uh, received a code case violation in regards to um, retail uh, clothing being so-called, quote unquote, out in the public. Um, as you can see, these photos are some historical photos of my building. Um, the original building envelope, as you can see in those photos, um, shows that the location in which we put our clothing is actually inside the envelope of the original historical building. Um, furthermore, in the subsequent pages, you'll see photographs that I've taken today. I spent about 20 minutes today going through the entire village taking pictures of all the violations. And you'll see 17 plus violations, all the other retail businesses. Um, we feel like, number one, we are not violating the code because our clothing is actually inside the original building envelope of that historical building, which is also called Camp Capitola's superintendent office. So the, it's the corner building. Kickback is on the corner of 201B Monterey Avenue, corner of Monterey and Capitola Avenue. Um, I've had the store, my family, since I was five years old. Um, we've been having clothing out in that business um, forever. I recently received this violation. Um, talked to my counsel. He told me to come to this meeting. 
and uh, give you this exhibit, uh, which in our opinion clearly shows that we are not in violation of this uh, you know, code case. And we are asking for it to be fully dismissed. And in addition, we feel that we are being targeted unfairly because of our location, because we are a high visible location. And if you notice in these other photos here, um, businesses like, I don't want to actually name the businesses, but they're in those photos, you clearly see that there's numerous um, merchandise being outside, we're seeing signs, um, we're also seeing chairs, all types of things. These are great for business. Um, Capitol is having a hard time as it is. You, you, as you walk or drive by Capitola Village, you'll notice several empty businesses, more than we've ever seen. And that's actually unheard of for the summer. This is like where we make our money. Um, we feel like, and I've talked to numerous uh, retail owners, feel like this is uh, hindering our small businesses. So um, number one, I'm just trying to clearly state that I feel like we've been falsely accused of this and it doesn't pertain to our business because of the nature of the architecture. And number two, I feel like the city is arbitrarily enforcing these codes and at random and we've been targeted. Other businesses are not complying. And those pictures that I took today, and that was just today, me walking around, clearly show that you know no one's following these rules. So I guess that's my point. Um, and I tried to get this dismissed. And I hope that you guys can really understand where I'm coming from. And I think that evidence there uh, is black and white. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so just to be clear, this is public comment period. We can take in the public comment. Um, the Planning Commission cannot provide any feedback on it. They would actually be the appeal board if this was, if our, if this did go to citation and was appealed, so it would not be appropriate for feedback from the Planning Commission um, other than discussion of zoning code updates relevant to the outdoor display. So we'll move on to the next public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Goran Klopic. I played uh, basketball today this morning at JC Park. I walked back from JC Park and I found some uh, paraphernalia in front of uh, Shadowbrook uh, parking lot there. Uh, when I called the authorities, uh, they didn't seem to understand English very well anymore. You know, maybe I uh, need to speak French or German or some other languages that I acquired during my military service and the army service. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Any more oral communication? Hearing none. Um, moving on to item four is planning commission and staff comments. Is there any staff comments? Uh, yes, I have a comment for the record, please. I would, I would like to thank um, those who have commented on the uh, municipal code. We've been doing a lot of modifications to the code in the last couple of years, actually. We've been doing the best, our can, best we can, but we don't actually have to live with the code like those applicants do and who have to implement the judgments that we, we create. And the nuances and the sticking points can easily avoid our, uh, our attention um, and so the more feedback we can get from those who actually have to implement this code, uh, the better we off are creating a, a code that's, that's livable. Um, and uh, I think we've been pretty good about historically uh, of incorporating comments from those people who have come forward um, and, and will continue to do so. So again, we've, we've had some comments just today, a very good letter came in. Um, and and I hope that uh, I hope that we get more of that because we really we really do need the input. Thank you. Thank you. No staff comments this evening. Anybody else? No. Um, okay. Moving on to our public hearing. Public hearings are intended to provide an opportunity for public discussion of each item listed on the public hearing. The following procedure is as follows: staff presentation. 
to um, second, pl planning commission questions, third, pl public comment, fourth, planning commission deliberation, and five, decision. Um, I think we agreed that we're going to have the staff presentation and then public comment addressing um, yeah. specifics. So we have a number of topics for tonight. When we get to the conclusion of the first topic, the public can comment on any item that's in the packet. Thank you. We have a staff presentation. So good evening, Planning Commission. Uh, my name is Ben Noble. I'm the city's consultant assisting with this zoning code update effort. And so the purpose of the meeting tonight is uh, to receive Planning Commission feedback on a preliminary set of draft zoning code amendments uh, and to focus on a few proposed amendments of topics of interest. Uh, and then um, to receive Planning Commission feedback on a, num on a number of new issues um, that we may wish to address in the zoning code amendments. And uh, so I think the, the plan is I'll have a few introductory slides just to refresh everybody on where we are in the process. Uh, and then we'll uh, um, spend some time looking at five specific issues that were identified in the staff report. Uh, the Planning Commission will also have an opportunity to bring up any other issues or questions or comments you have about the draft amendments that were in your packet. And then we'll move into um, uh, a discussion of some of the new issues that we wanted to talk about tonight. So here on the screen is the schedule that shows what we've completed and where we're headed. So the, the Planning Commission has, has had four study sessions previously, and today is the fifth study session. Uh, also on this schedule is some of the actions related to the housing element uh, update. So on August 8th, the Planning Commission will make a recommendation on the revisions to the draft housing element update. Uh, and that's relevant to this work on the zoning code update because a lot of these zoning code amendments are to implement specific actions that are contained in the housing element. So um, what is in the housing element uh, is very relevant to the amendments um, that are before you tonight. So we need to synchronize these two processes. Um, so uh, the Planning Commission will have another meeting on the zoning code amendments on August 15th. Uh, and the packet for that will be published uh, August by August 9th. And at that meeting, there will be some additional amendments um, that haven't yet been drafted um, that will be uh, before you. And at that meeting, you'll have everything except for the mall amendments. And we're holding off on the specific text of those mall amendments until the city council has adopted the uh, revised housing element update. So this is coming to you a little bit piecemealed, but there's a reason for it. We want to make sure that the policy in the housing element is set before the zoning code amendments that implement that policy come before you. Um, and so uh, the first hearing at which you could recommend to the city council adoption of all of the zoning code amendments, including the mall amendments, um, would be on the um, August uh, 29th meeting. Um, so that would be the hearing on August 29th. And we have a couple of other dates in the schedule for additional hearings, if that's needed, for the Planning Commission to um, make a recommendation on all of the proposed um, zoning code amendments. And then once the Planning Commission makes its recommendation that goes to the City Council, uh, they'll have a little introduction to the content um, at their meeting on September 26th or se September 26th that will position them to uh, hold a public hearing um, on October 10th um, and potentially uh, take action on the amendments with a second reading plan for October 24th. So that's the schedule and that's the game plan moving forward. And we wanted to check and see if there were any questions about, about uh, this. So yeah, a question. Do we expect a formal letter from the housing HCD before the 8th, or we're just kind of going to go with this round and see what happens next? Great question. So um, we don't expect the formal letter before the 8th, 
but we do expect it before the August 22nd adoption by city council. If we don't have the conditional letter, we'll probably bump it back to the next, one more meeting. All right, any other questions or comments about the schedule? Great. Okay, so in the packet tonight, there were two attachments. There is a summary table of the proposed amendments, that's attachment one, and um, attachment two uh, is the preliminary draft zoning code amendments. And as I mentioned previously, these amendments include um, zoning code implementation actions as well as, well as other needed changes to the zoning code. And um, the uh, preliminary draft zoning code amendments include most, but not all amendments. So it doesn't include the mall related amendments because we're waiting on the housing element for that. Um, and there are also a couple of other amendments that are not included uh, in this preliminary draft because we haven't finished drafting them yet. Um, we wanted to take to you tonight what we had ready, give you an opportunity to review and comment on that, and then other material as it's finished will be presented to you at future meetings. Okay, so in the packet, um, in attachment two, the zoning code amendments includes only the chapters with a proposed amendment. So um, a chapter that does not include any proposed amendments, like the variance chapter, for example, we didn't include it in the packet to, to limit the length of the packet. Um, it means that in those chapters, there are no proposed amendments. Uh, so in the summary table uh, for each topic, uh, we identified prior planning commission direction and list the amendments location and description. So that summary table, if there's a topic that the amendment's not included in tonight's packet, there's a note saying not draft it yet. Um, and so that will be coming to you at future meetings. All right, so as mentioned previously and as discussed in the staff report, there are five um, topics that we think of, that we think are of particular interest in the preliminary draft uh, zoning code amendments. And I have a few slides to just present the content for each topic. Um, after which uh, the Planning Commission will have an opportunity to provide uh, feedback on those amendments. Uh, and the plan is that after my presentation on design review, we will open up the public comment and members of the public who wish to speak um, can address the design review issue as well as any other issue if they want um, as part of um, that public comment period. And I think that if the chair um, wishes to reopen the public comment after presentations on these other issues or any at or any other point in the meeting, uh, you can do that if you wish. Okay. All right. So design review was previously discussed by the Planning Commission at multiple prior meetings. And based on that direction, the preliminary draft zoning code amendments uh, re or, uh, I'm sorry, let me take a step back. So the Planning Commission direction at those prior meetings was to reestablish the Architecture and Site Review Committee. Um, also to clarify if committee should review all design permits for single family homes or just major projects such as new single family homes. Uh, there's also desire from the Planning Commission to see a public notice requirement for pending applications. So we took that direction and we prepared the draft amendments related to design review. And these amendments begin on uh, page 194 of your packet. And, it, and it, they address three main issues. One, notice of submitted application. Two, development and design review committee. And then lastly, the design review criteria. So I'm gonna speak briefly about these three things. So with public notice, there's a new requirement that for design permit applications reviewed by the Planning Commission, that the applicant must post notice of submitted application prior to application, uh, and that the city will deem the application complete only after the notice is published, uh, posted. And so related to the Development Design Review Committee, um, we're using that name, for this committee. And so the zoning code specifically states that this committee uh, exists and that its review is required for design permit applications reviewed by the Planning Commission and that the committee consists of city staff from planning, building, and public works department. 
There's also language in the amendments about when a city contracted design professional participates in committee meetings. And so it's for um, more significant projects, um, upper floor additions to an existing single family home or multifamily structure, uh, new primary structures, including new single family homes, multifamily buildings, and non-residential buildings, and additions to an existing non-residential structure that's either 15% or more of the floor area of the existing structure and visible from the primary street frontage or 3,000 square feet or more. So um, with this list, we intended to capture the projects that we think are more significant and would benefit from the participation of a city contract design professional in the committee meetings. So the amendments also specify uh, that the committee assesses proposed projects for conformance with the design review criteria. Uh, and then the amendments also specify that the Planning Commission staff report contains uh, a committee assessment and, and project revisions in response to committee recommendations, if any. So the idea is to make sure that the information uh, that is discussed at the committee meetings and any revisions to the projects as a result of those discussions make their way to the Planning Commission so that you have that information when you're taking action on the application. So the last part of the amendments to the design review section involved the design review criteria. Um, and we see this as a first step to potential future amendments um, that might review, revise these um, criteria. Uh, and the first step is to add references to existing objective standards that are relevant to the criteria so that staff, the applicant, and the Planning Commission have that information about existing uh, standards in the zoning code that relate to these topics, whether it's lighting, signage, landscaping, or things like that. Uh, I think there's also the possibility uh, to make further revisions to these criteria. Um, that would translate some of the more nebulous subjective language, such as coastal village charm, um, into more objective standards to the extent that that's possible. I think that's a more involved effort, and we want to make sure that we take the time to get that right uh, if that's the path we take. All right, so that concludes my presentation. I think this is the longest presentation of all the topics, so don't worry too much. Um, but uh, we wanted to go over that and um, uh, request planning commission feedback after receiving public comment on whether there are any changes needed to um, these preliminary draft design review amendments related to design review. And I think our hope is that we receive your feedback tonight and that when, when we come back with revised language that you're gonna feel it's in a place where you can recommend adoption without any further major changes to the material. So with that, I'll pass it back to the chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I was reading. <laughs> But, um, thank you. <laughs> Apologies. Um, do we have one? Oh, let's open the public hearing. Hello, commissioners. My name is Janine Roth. I'm, I have family that live in Capitola. I'm also, you've seen me before, I'm with Santa Cruz Yimby. Um, I sent a letter, unfortunately it was very late today, so we may not have seen it. Uh, Director Hurley, he uh, got it late yesterday, so I do have a copy that I can send. Um, I wanna first of all thank you all for the work and the discussion that has gone before this meeting, uh, both on the staff side and also the commissioners. I've listened to every single meeting that you've had on this. It's clear that you're very engaged. And I especially want to highlight that and appreciate that in that discussion, I've heard many of the approaches that really help to enable more homes for people to be built. And those sorts of things are the removal of development constraints, height, density, also objective standards. Um, the consultant just mentioned that, and that's a super important thing to making it easier and quicker for uh, projects to move forward. So I really want to appreciate the conversations that you've had about that thus far. Because my letter was sent so late and it contains some details, I'm not going to actually read it 
uh, to you. <laughs> um, I'll leave that for you, you to do whenever you can. But I do want to touch on some of the themes and how they relate to the topics before you today. When it comes to modifying the development constraints, looking at things like the height and making it easier for people to build, I did want to note that in the lot consolidation, there's been a proposed change to the height in the mixed use zone that's equivalent to the high density residential zone. However, I don't think it's quite high enough because mixed use is mixed use and a ground floor typically has a higher ceiling. So I want to encourage you to think about whether that should be higher to accommodate the mixed use. Um, as well in the modification to or removal of development constraints, still think the parking's too high. Um, you have two parking spots for multifamily that are at square footage that's half of what the single family is. So please consider that. On the design review, I'll just say that I really noticed that there was not much of a connection to your objective standards for multifamily. It didn't see it in there at all. And your design review criteria is highly subjective. So I really encourage you to work on that because you are not gonna make things easy for yourselves or others with subjective standards. And I know some of you feel that way because I heard you say it. Um, on the referral of applications to the Planning Commission, I just have a simple question for you guys. Why would something that doesn't have to come to you, you're not elected, but why would something that doesn't have to come to you come to you? I, I just don't know the answer to that question. And I wondered, um, I, anyway, I'll leave it as, as a question. And then as well on the objective standards, um, you know, it's great that there's a coastal development permit waiver for ADUs. I do wanna highlight that your coastal your LCP, your implementation plan, is filled with subjectivity. Oh my gosh, there's so much subjectivity in that. And I know that part of what you have, about half of Capitola is in the coastal zone, and I just think that what you're doing here to incentivize or encourage housing is gonna un be undermined by your local coastal program. Anyway, I see my time is nearly up. I, again, just want to say thank you for your time and attention and the hard work. Thank you. Do you have any additional public comment? Okay, bringing it back to Planning Commission questions, comments? I have, I have one question, just so I make certain that I understand. So, under the current process that we use for design review, the applicant comes in and they have a meeting with the um, public works, building, planning, uh, and sit down and talk about their application, uh, which is you know, similar to what happens on with the design review committee. And I think it was, at least it was my intention, that really the only thing we were going to change in that process was to add a professional architect to be a part of that group. But the process itself is really not changing much. I mean, I could be wrong. I'm sort of asking, is, is that correct? Uh, because, um, you know, I agree that, that we don't want to do anything that's going to make it more difficult for someone to get their application approved. The idea was that if you had this meeting, then the neighbors and public would have the opportunity to also attend it if they wanted to because they would see the notice in front of the people's property that an application was, was pending, not that they would be sent a particular notice. So I guess I want to make certain that my assumptions about the process that's being done now is really similar to what would be happening, except that a professional would be added to it. That wrong or right? I mean, just tell me. You want to? 
Yes, thank you, Commissioner Westman. So the intent here, I know there's quite a bit of red line, perhaps more than you expected. Uh, the intent here is to follow a similar uh, process that we currently practice. Some of this is, has been made more uh, specified in the code, um, but it would be consistent with what we do today. The, you are correct that we have uh, added a requirement for some of the uh, types of projects with the outside consultant input. Um, and similarly, the added requirement for uh, earlier noticing on site. Um, one thing I don't believe that we've specified or required here, um, and it, w it would be a change from today, unlike what we used to do in with Arc and Site, is that generally when these are advisory meetings, as are almost all uh, development design review meetings, they are not something that a general member of the public could attend or comment at. Uh, when we had the architecture and site review committees, those were uh, admittedly, almost all of them were advisory, but they were uh, Brown Act posted, they were posted on our website, they were generally open to the public. We, did, we didn't have attendance from the public very often, but they were open to the public. The des development design review meetings, unless it's an administrative one, are not generally open to the public. So okay. that's the direction of commission. We would probably want to specify that. I lost, I lost you on that. So you're saying that there won't be public noticing for this meeting or there will, but not? There would be a earlier notice on site required for design permits in general. It would not be specific to a meeting or a hearing. It is simply uh, as written a means to allow passerbys, neighbors to be aware of something that is now in process. They would but as they look at that, they'll see, okay, when is my opportunity to um, weigh in on this? And you're going to have the what number, what date posted? So it would it would have a it would have a date to say date posted, uh, but it would not have a a hearing date because this they would be posting this before anything had been scheduled. The the earlier that we have to require. When a hearing is scheduled, that, that means the earlier that a project has to be deemed complete. So if we were to try to tie this to a, a specific hearing date, we would likely be uh, delaying a project's time to a hearing by that much time. If we require that it needs to be tied to a specific hearing 45 days in advance, that means we would need to know 45 days in advance that so they the, are deemed complete and ready. There's likely to be two postings then. One to just to say, okay, it's coming, and so that the public would have an opportunity to come to the desk and say, what's this all about, and they get some questions and whatnot, and get as much information as possible. And then when it's formally posted, they say, okay, here's where I can, you know, where's it? Yep, so it will be posted for the planning commission meeting for a specific date with a public hearing, but there'll be no public hearing at the architect and site, or the design, development and design review. Another question, if we're still on questions. Um, so the city contracted professional, are this, so this is a paid professional now as opposed to in the past it's been a volunteer position. So in the past, it's it, yeah, it's been a stipend, so the effect has been a largely volunteer capacity, and in this case it would be changing to a contractual basis. Do we have any idea how much that's going to be? So that, that is the process we have in place right now for multifamily and mixed use, or multifamily, mixed use, and commercial. And those, the cost ranges between um, the most recent one was around $600 for the new leaf, just looking at the, the new exterior of the building, and up to, I think it was about um, like $3,600 for the review, maybe $3,800 for the review of the affordable housing development on 38th Avenue and upwards of, for the mall redevelopment, I think we had a deposit account much, that was much higher for, but it didn't go that far. So, so for the idea for this, uh, bringing in single family homes into the design review process, we would update our RFP, our request for proposals, um, or work with RRM to adjust the, the, I think we would actually need an updated contract with this assignment. 
and we're we can guide that so we can guide exactly like if we if we publish the development and design review and circulate it on a friday their comments will be due the next wednesday at the design review meeting um, and it'll be a competitive process for architects to submit and we'll be asking for a, probably a set fee per single family home so that there's really clear parameters tied to a single family home and it doesn't go beyond um, because really we're trying not to increase the cost here. There's a balance when you're working for a city and the cost does have to go back to the person who's the developer unless the city council came forward and said we should waive that additional cost. I think uh, it might help to go back to maybe reflect where, where some of these comments came up from. I think going back, um, just being on the planning commission for last, you know, coming up year and a half, um, we heard uh, a lot from noticing, you know, that uh, public hasn't been noticed. Um, they weren't aware of projects. Um, they didn't have opportunity for input and stuff like that. So I think where this comes from, and I, I think there could be a happy meeting for this, is a way to um, identify what those issues are for the community. And I think the sign being put up is notifying them, um, having them have an opportunity because just speaking for myself, you know, our project comes in and we have feedback and there's some de design criteria that could be very costly for something if we made a change. Example, a window location, if we suggest that maybe all the structure works then. So going back to the original art and textual review committee, I think there's time for input about some of that stuff. Um, I would like to look at, you know, the opportunity, what those costs are, because in no way I would like to slow up development or anything in our community or, or you know, costly thing, but I think there's a counterbalance to having a process put in place that we can also make sure that other community members are notified and to have some input about some of the development that's going on in the community that's not cost prohibitive or it causes or stifle development in the community. So I would just like to make those comments and see how we can get to that. So yeah. I, I, I agree. I think this the staff or Ben did a good job of the language on uh, paragraph F on what we intended and also on the notice. I mean, the, <laughs> in my mind, the notice is to actually have neighbors talk to each other. I know it's unusual these days and <laughs> instead of texting, but this will at least uh, allow neighbors to understand what, what's going to happen in you know, houses adjacent to them and they can actually make comments about window locations and hopefully resolve things within the neighborhood before it even gets to us. The uh, revised arc and site process of paragraph F, I think, is very good. I, I actually like the original arc and site idea. The fact that we're not uh, publicly noticing it, I don't think really makes a difference. I don't think we really have much of a connection with the community. And as long as the prof so the thing that, that really I don't like is uh, in design review criteria item B, neighborhood compatibility, it's way too open-ended. We say comply with applicable development standards. It's like, what does that mean? Does that mean Secretary of the Interior design standards for every building? Um, does it mean we got to go down through all the list of things here in uh, Section 120, and then you got to go back to Section 896, and you've got to search through the code to find all of the design standards? I, I don't know if we could ferret out a list that we could refer people to, but that also is one of the functions this professional and staff can help the applicant with is wander your way through all these design objective design standards that we've created now in order to uh, assist the applicant in the process because it's getting to be a bit of a nightmare for them. But I do like, I think the idea, the intent is good. It, it should, in theory, speed up an application if it's done properly. Sorry, I just have a question. Um, just remind me, when did we um, do away with the art and site committee? What year was that? 2020. 2020. And so, I mean, I'd also, you know, at, at, you know, where we were 2020 and where we are today, two different places. Um, just speaking from a community perspective standpoint, I see a lot more people are more into volunteering, giving back and stuff like that. Uh, is there something that we could possibly... Uh, reach out to local architects to see, you know, we said that the, the stipend part didn't work, but you know, that was four years ago. Um, is there an opportunity to help in offset some costs for our applicants that 
maybe there are some local architects that maybe have retired or might want might work on that and that that was that would be a process other than having direct costs to an applicant with that i um i'd also have to talk with the city clerk about just creating these committees and if we're trying to make sure it's not a brown act committee how how that works so I, I, how we did it before i guess that it wasn't clear i'm sorry like before we had a stipend not for i'm saying planning commission i'm saying stipend for an architect to sit on other than going out for having like you said you have to have an rfp and like an rm or something like that um i was using them as an example but um when they're when there be a possibility of opening up to see if other architects might be a more cost effective way to handle this too would what would be helpful tonight would be to know if that is the um if the majority of planning commissioners would like us to do that we can look into that and if it would stay within the parameters of where we're headed in terms of like um having a public process at a, a de development and design review meeting versus not if if it works we can build that into the revisions of the code i was um, i'm sorry I mean to go ahead i i was under the impression i think kind of where your question was um tracking is that we're trying to consolidate the the arkansite process so it's not inconveniencing anything and we're kind of trying to make it as efficient as we move along um making I'm trying to think of the best way to say it. If we, if we, if we have a design professional sit in on the design development meetings, that was how I was imagining this kind of. It was a hybrid between, you know, the official Arkansas meeting that we used to have with all the, the appointed architects and design professionals and public works and city people, and then um, marching through and doing the whole, you know, the planning. Uh, commission review. So I, I was wondering, or actually my question would be if if we could take the appointed or the selected design professional, whether it be an architect or a building designer for single family homes, have them be incorporated in those design meetings, the preliminary design meetings, without having it be noticed. It would just be more of an advocacy program where you have, I don't want to say a program, a more advocacy position, much like um, one of us is appointed on a commission, you know, that it would be relative to those types of time um, commitments where you have, you're given the materials and then you're, you participate in the design development of the specific project. Obviously, bigger projects would be different, like you're saying, but um, for single family homes, does that, I mean, does that kind of track to what we were discussing previously? It does. And I, I think the new part of the conversation is that we'd like to keep the down yes the applicant right so I think it's keeping it on the same timeline without increasing costs so we can we can look for an alternative and just make sure it complies with the Brown Act and um, just in terms of like creating committees and mm -hmm. uh, I agree with Commissioner Esty one of my concerns was we kept constantly hearing from neighbors that they didn't know you know that this was happening next door two doors down so I, I really think the idea of, you know, having a more significant posting on the site um, early on gives the neighbors the opportunity to absolutely know that something's going on in their neighborhood and that there's enough information on it that they can, you know, contact their neighbor and talk to them about it or, you know, come down here to City Hall and say, you know, I want to know what's happening on my street. Um, uh, to me, that's that's the more important thing than having it sort of a noticed public meeting that people are going to attend. Uh, I, I don't need to have that part of it. I just want the community to have the opportunity to, um, you know, have their say early on uh, because um, uh, I agree and the point was uh, raised earlier. Um, you know, the more th problems that can be resolved early on between the neighbors and in the design actually make it less expensive rather than having constant redesigns of a project or having a project 
come to the planning commission and then you know the neighbors stand up and say well we didn't know and this is a real problem for us and you know go through those steps i guess my comment as to whether the consultant should be paid by the i guess the applicant is we're going to pass the fees on to the applicant i presume or a volunteer i i would lean towards a professional only because we've added over the years and relatively significant number of objective standards, which are still subject, somewhat subjective, so it does take an expert yeah, architect to really understand what we intend. And if they're getting paid for it, I think you're just going to get a faster turnaround on, on their response. And I, I, I don't want to complicate things, but, um, you know, right now we have a process on the larger projects where they go to RRM design and they're reviewed, you know, by a number of people in their organization for different aspects of that project. And to me, that's a little more complicated than just looking at a single family house. So I'm not of the mind that we have to have one design professional that's going to do both. <clears throat> and, um, you know, because uh, if it's a major commercial project going on, I don't know if I'm happy with just having a building designer look at it. Yeah. Um, but if it's a single family house, I'm perfectly happy having a building designer look at it. So maybe we could, you know, create some flexibility. And I don't think it has to be the same professional every time. Um, which might make it easier to, you know, hire people and recruit them. I've got a few comments. <laughs> First of all, I, I agree with the idea of one meeting, not, not an architect site meeting and a design review meeting. So if we have one meeting that's noticed ahead of time, great. I love that. What I don't like are all the subjective uh, design review criteria that are listed. I, I'll just give you one example. Landscaping. Lands <laughs> I am on page 196. Is that 196? No. What is this? Yes, 196 of the, the little circle. That's why I'm confused. I don't have a 196. Well, item 5A, page 263 of 307 up in the right-hand corner. 263 of 305, sorry. You're at 263? Yeah. Okay. 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 I'm ready. Okay, so M says landscaping. Landscaping is an integral part of the overall project design. Pointless statement. Is appropriate uh, to the site structures and enhances the surrounding criteria. So what what does that mean? That's that's a completely subjective. There's lots of subjective words like that throughout. A through S, and I think that needs to be thoroughly scrubbed to get rid of the subjective requirements. So I'd, I'd like to read what, what I'm seeing and just to make sure we're all on, have the same version, but mine says landscaping as an integral part of the overall project design is appropriate to the site and structure and enhances the surrounding area and complies with all the applicable standards of Chapter 17.72 landscaping. Trees planted, plantings, and removal are consistent with Chapter 12.12 .12, community trees and forest management. So the red lines there were our attempt to bring in objective standards and tie it back to the code for the landscaping chapter and the tree chapter and then the fluff at the beginning is just to Ooh. kind of say the purpose of this, but we could remove the, the fluff. Well, or, it just it, seems to me it opens up it opens up the door to all kinds of opportunities for rogue planning commissioners to say well, that doesn't meet the doesn't enhance the surrounding area. Well, so I object to that. Right, but but they've caveated they've added the. The standards so you you know where to look this one i actually thought was pretty well written because mm -hmm. it tells you where to look it says and places. complies right and well, yeah complies. right so it says all the all the fluff at the beginning is your opportunity to dig in and start being subjective as a planning commissioner and then and have objective criteria 
So I, I, I just, you know, I didn't go through all 20 of these uh, in detail, but I just, I just thought that, 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 that was, those kinds of words are too subjective and should be removed. I understand what you're saying. <laughs> I do. I, in referencing the landscape code when designing a landscape, I feel that they, like Commissioner Esty was saying, their reference to the, the applicable standards of 17.72, those outline pretty objective, um, like, like you have to have a canopy coverage, you have to have these, you know, and, but then enhancing it by saying uh, appropriate to the site structures and enhancing the surrounding area, I think seems to, just in response to what you're saying, I think, think seems to mesh the two where like our flowering tree is good, our, you know, like having those sub subjective standards saying, you know, maybe you have an argument to plant something that would be a little bit, you know, less ordinary. I mean, I, I think. Well, again, I, I mean, we had the Yimby person come up here and talk about eliminating subjective standards. We've had the state come back and say eliminate subjective standards. It's been drilled into our head to to remove that wherever possible, and I think we should take that advice and just say, I don't want to have planning commissioners have openings to to just say, oh, that doesn't fit with the village as I interpret it. So, so you would be okay with the language that ends with integral part of the overall project designed and complies with applicable standards and drop all the fluff appropriate to the site, enhances the surrounding area, blah, blah, blah. It would just, it would start with complies with all applicable standards of 17.72 and et cetera. You don't like the statement of fact that landscaping is an integral part of the overall project design? I think that's, I suppose that's, I suppose that's, yes, that's, that's correct. I can't, uh, if I may. Um, it, <laughs> It does sound like we're getting some consensus about this, and, and if we have a, if we have a, yeah, I think so. If if we have a majority here uh, with feedback that the planning commission would like to see just a, a larger attempt at making these criteria more objective, we can we can return with um, additional red lines for you to review, um, and then we can move on if you'd like. Uh, I mean, I, I would be absolutely fine if we say that, you know, landscaping is an integral part of the overall project design, period. And then say something about, you know, uh, or not a period, and just say and then start and complies with all applicable standards. So if you want to take out is appropriate to the site and structures and enhances the surrounding areas, doesn't bother me at all because that doesn't change anything. I, I think it opens a door, but as long as you think so, that's great. And I think we need to go through all of these, A through S, and with that same sharp pencil. Madam Chair. Right, but I oh, I'm sorry. If, <laughs> could funny. I offer a few perspectives on this? Of course. <laughs> Apologize. So there's certain topics in these design review findings where there are standards in the zoning code that relate. So, for example, there's a lot of there's a lot of standards in the landscaping section that are objective and measurable, um, uh, and one option for the city is to simply um, remove the findings that uh, already are addressed with existing objective standards. So the project either conforms with those standards or it doesn't. Um, there's no sort of discretionary consideration of whether or not it conforms with those standards. And so there's about half of them where there are existing objective standards. So the, simple, the, the, the city, the, the design review uh, chapter simply can say the project conforms to the standards in these chapters, end of story. And then with other topics, such as architectural style, massing, community character, those are inherently subjective and there are not existing objective standards that can be relied upon now. Um, I think those for now would need to remain um, and if the city wanted to try to translate those into 
objective standards, I think that would be a process um, that would fall outside of what we're doing right now. So I guess to summarize a possible action, a, a possible approach to this is for these topics where there are existing objective standards, we remove the subjective language and replace it with a reference to those standards for the criteria where there are no existing objective standards, we keep them in for now um, with the potential to translate them into objective standards in the future. I agree with that approach. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that's good. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> my next, yes, thanks, Ben. Uh, my next issue, again, has to do with the um, city contracted design professional. Now, I recall when when we discussed this initially, it was, it was Jerry and I had a, a conversation about whether or not the Arkansas Committee was beneficial or harmful. In my case, it was counterproductive, I thought. And in his case, it was um, very beneficial for good reasons. So it occurred to me that it might be a good idea to re remove the word shall and add the word may to give the opportunity for the applicant to avoid the stipend or the fee and say, you know, this is a this is an, an opportunity to get better feedback. It's going to get me through in. Yeah, yeah, I, I do want to pay that stipend. I do want to get that influence because this is, you know, I want to I want to ease my way through this process as easily as possible. On the other hand, if they feel confident in their architect or for whatever reason they're strapped for cash or whatever, they say they could just say. No, no, I want to. I want to just. I want to just go through this, and I don't want to have a bunch of random inputs from another architect that I wish. I wish to ignore. Uh, and so that way, to me, that's the best of both worlds. If you allow them to have a contracted design professional, that's already all set up, and just kind of like we have the ADU designs. So if you want to use the pre-approved ADU, here it is. It's easy. It's straightforward. Same thing with the with the contracted uh, architect. We've got one. He's cheap. He's used all the time. We know he's they have good 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 input. If you want to use it? We recommend that. If you don't, fine. That's how I would approach this. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think we're either going to do it or we're not going to do it. It's kind of like a yeah. I I I, I tend to agree with that. If you have a process and it's one process, or we don't have a process. Kind of what I yeah, I agree. I just I keep reflecting back to the last couple of years of sitting on the commission <laughs> and um, having applicants have building designers present their projects and having these applications come through. I feel like they, you know, quite potentially could have opted out of talking with uh, with an architect. And the design professional that they're utilizing is very, you know, has their convictions, has their presentation that they want to convey, which is valid and legitimate. But there are alternatives that those individuals did, did not consider that we discussed during deliberation. And I don't know would be brought up if they didn't, if, if they weren't noticed, you know, and that's kind of where I, I feel that, I mean, again, as efficient a, as possible. <laughs> I don't think an, an independent architect is going to be able to read our minds better than the original architect. Oh, a, a complete, very true. However, those those people that I'm kind of referencing in my mind, I think I keep coming back to the the, um, the really high pitched church built looking cathedral like built single family home on Escalona, and the other one was um, across the street at four fourteen. I think mm -hmm. um, those are both. Items that I clearly remember, you know, having the the design professional was an interior designer, and she does not she's not required to be an architect or have that type of experience to um, design those structures, which is fine. But there there are elements within that design that aren't enhancing that that aren't doing Capitol any favors. It isn't doing the client any favors, and so I think ha incorporating somebody. That has that type of vernacular that can that can you know quickly help those people figure it out a little bit. Just those small details would really make it helpful. I'm, I, I don't, I mean, no, that's I and I that's just my overall point. <laughs> well, it, it sounds like you have your direction on that one as well. 
So I won't belabor that any further. Uh, and those were my three points on that topic. Thank you. Um, okay. Would you like us to summarize what we heard? Yeah. Yes, please. So keep costs down at the same timing of, and keep the same timing of the process. So we'll really work on flexibility within a future contract so that single family homes have, are, are not uh, financially, the burden isn't there. We're also going to look into um, the committee and the possibility of having We'll look at alternatives to see with what ties into that keep costs down approach. And I'm also, I think it's very clear that larger developments can be treated differently than a single family home. And then for the standards to review our design standards, let's make the objective standards truly objective and take out any subjectivity there. And then realize that for those, um, community character standards, we'll keep them in for now with the goal of really cleaning this up in the long term. But for the short term benefit, we'll get it to a certain point. A point of clarification, just when you talked about larger projects, that just being the same process it is now, we're not. Correct. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So that's not changing anything for any new projects. No, we'll just make sure that they're writing up reports that are more official and the Planning Commission can look through the report rather than just getting feedback during those meetings that we summarize into staff reports. Time, no time adjustment, no cost adjustment. There's a little more time that goes into a larger development and reviewing the different design. different from today. Not different than today. Perfect, thank you. I had one last question, just a pot with the notice. Um, uh, the notice of submitted application. The, um, I had been speaking with Brian about the small yellow eight and a half by eleven posting, kind of in the green one. Are they green or yellow? They're green, oh. but some of them turn yellow. They're there so long. I know. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> we went back and forth on the phone about. I was just the actual posting of that eight and a half by eleven poster. It's um, it needs to be bigger, bigger and bigger with more of a, a graph like approachability to it and I just I'm wondering if that's a possibility or if that's a consideration at all yeah I was going to ask are we going to have something that says this notice needs to be 12 by 18 on white paper and black print and what if so we would certainly specify uh, the type and form and minimum size on the postings that applicants would be required to, to post where we'd like to model it after the County of Santa Cruz in which um, it will say in very large letters, um, the notice of uh, proposed development, and then it would have, they've got a really good guidance document of exactly what is expected of an applicant um, in terms of what the posting looks like with the architect's contact information as well as the city planner so that they can come and ask questions. And we would be giving them the description of the application within their 30-day turnaround so that a lot of times we get applications that have a description and then as we look through the application, we're like, oh, this needs a variance or they're asking for a height exception. So we'll have, we'll, we'll give them the exact description um, so that, but yes, and it'll have to be on a certain type of paper that is weatherproof and all of those things. It'll be very specific and, and large. Okay, thank you. And that, that detail, though, won't be in the code. Right. Um, and so um, the, a, a, lot, a lot of these details won't be in the code because it doesn't belong in the code and you want to have the flexibility to modify things as, the, as things progress. Um, in terms of the code as it's drafted now, I, um, I think the notice of submitted application sort of looks, the language looks good the way it is now. Development Design Review Committee language. Um, I, th I think it's probably okay the way it's drafted right now. We'll look at that and make sure that your comments um, and sort of the vision for this is consistent with how that language is written right now. It's the design review criteria that where we'll need to make the most changes. And when that comes back to you, you'll see, the, you'll see how that's different. Thank you. This is just advisory, so there's no determination. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, you you want to move on? Yes. Point? Yep. Okay. okay. So um, next topic is lot consolidation. So this was previously discussed by the Planning Commission. Um, and uh, in response to staff recommendation, the Planning Commission um, directed us to develop incentives to encourage lot consolidation um, uh, on adjacent housing element opportunity sites to allow higher FAR for projects that consolidate lots. Um, we also talked a little bit about other potential incentives, um, and the recommendation at that time was to not include um, those other incentives as part of this uh, set of zoning code amendments. So this is in the preliminary draft zoning code amendments. It's on pages 37 and 46. Um, and uh, for the MUN and the CC zoning districts, it identifies a lot consolidation allowance. Um, so in the MUN zoning district, for example, right now the maximum height is 27. Maximum FAR is 1.0, uh, but in order to incentivize lot consolidation. Me. Can we have a, a, a restroom break? Because we're kind of having one. Okay. Thank you. It's a short recess. <laughs> Sorry.
Everybody settle? Yeah. Okay. Please proceed. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So the lot consolidation bonus in the MUN um, would be 35 feet in FAR of 1.5. And so that would allow three stories, um, which could be uh, all residential, um, or it could be two floors of uh, residential above ground floor commercial and or mixed use. And then so in the CC, the incentive would be for 50 feet of height, um, which um, could accommodate a four story vertical mixed use project um, with an FAR of 1.5. So that's what the proposed lot consolidation bonus is. And um, in the uh, comments received from Santa Cruz YIMBY, um, there were some comments related to these standards, uh, including uh, uh, potentially increasing the maximum allowed height in MUN, as well as questions about whether or not the city is considering other uh, incentives um, for lot consolidation, not just these bonus height. With that, uh, interested in Planning Commission feedback on the draft. Can I ask a question? Yes. So in the MUN zoning district, for example, um, while uh, mixed use is allowed in that zoning district, there's no requirement that what gets built on a lot is a mixed use site, right? I mean, someone could come in and just want to build an apartment building with no commercial as part of it. There are some limitations in the village, but if we're just referring to the mixed use neighborhood, I don't believe it's. Well, I was referring to the MUN, which is the neighborhood, uh, the one that runs up Capitola Avenue. I mean, yeah. That is correct. Yeah, it's, uh, multifamily dwellings are a conditionally permitted use in MUN, which is a single use multifamily dwelling. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, I just wanted to make certain that yeah. that information in my brain was correct. Do, do we want to open public comment for each? Did we agree to that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Agree. Okay. Would, would anybody from the public like to say anything about this particular point? I know you mentioned it earlier. <laughs> it's, a nice, it's nice having the discussion anyway. I think you've heard the comment that um, about mixed use, and I understand that there isn't a requirement for ground floor um, for the lot consolidation. However, I think you would like to have the option for ground floor. And 35, I think, can technically do three stories, but with the ground floor retail, I think you're, you can see you know, 36 to 40 if you're looking for ground floor and two levels of residential. So that's why I would just suggest you look at upping that a little bit. Part of it also is that 35 is what you have in your residential high density. So I'm, there's just a simple way of looking at it there that that's clearly not gonna have ground floor mixed use. So just adding some more height to the mixed use, which are on some of your corridors, which are prime for, um, for this sort of mixed use development. And I think, um, I just noted that in the housing element, you had identified a whole list of other strategies. I didn't hear full conversation, I might have missed it, about other strategies such as ministerial approval for any kind of lot consolidations, or um, you mentioned tax breaks. I, don't, I didn't hear any conversation about that, so that's why I mentioned in the letter, were there other incentives besides just relaxing the development standards? Thank you. In terms of um, for tax or like fees and that type of thing to decrease any fees or um, have any tax incentives, that would be something we would do through the city council. That isn't really a function of the planning commission, so that wouldn't be built into this code this evening. Um, ministerial approvals, that, that is something the planning commission could discuss if it and it might be within a lot consolidation, the way to go about that would be more um, the review of the subdivision 
you know, bringing the, that merger together, I think that's where that would be really appropriate to make sure like the consolidation is fast and easy while we're going through the planning commission process for the, for the structures, but um, that's the guidance I would be using. Right, but that consolidation could have an impact on the neighbor. It seems kind of odd to have just the ministerial approval. It should be more public approval. That's my, that's my two cents worth. I, I'm, if we want to raise the height, I'm in favor of that. It, encourage commercial use if we think that would help. Well, that'd be my question. And, or someone who has more experience with these commercial or multi-use business, uh, businesses, um, is that a correct critique? Yeah, I think that if, if you want it to allow for well-designed vertical mixed use, um, that's um, uh, three stories, uh, you would want to give a little more height. Um, and you could apply it just to a mixed-use project, um, maybe 40 feet, um, just to give a little bit more opportunity for there to be a higher ceiling on the ground floor of the commercial space. Well, I'd be in favor of that if it was for a mixed-use, like you said, noted for that. Me too. Yeah, same here. Yeah. 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 If they were proposing parking, Possibly on the on the lower floor, that's not something that's applicable and towards the lot consolidation consideration. So, par parking on the lower floor, like in the MUN, that's towards you know within base, like a higher base flood elevation. Um, instead of doing commercial on the lower story, if they propose parking, is that some type of? There's no, no. <clears throat> um, I'm I'm trying to think of the. The properties in the mixed-use neighborhood that are possibilities, and I, I believe some of them are right around. Where were our mixed-use neighborhood properties that were identified in the housing element? Uh, a lot of them are on Capitola Road. Yeah, Cap Capitola Road. Capitola Avenue. Mm -hmm. So yeah, ground floor, it could also, so if it was a straight-up residential project and subject to the 35 foot height and they could do ground floor but if it's mixed use it could bump up to 40. yeah I think it's I think that's a good idea encouraging mixed use okay thank you moving on um, do uh, there's no more public comment for deliberations any other folks any deliberating yeah I think they sort of answered the question yeah. they do seem to agree on height and the next topic. <laughs> it's, it gets easier as we progress through the topics, I think. So um, replacement housing, this is something you, you have not talked about previously, and it's simply uh, implementing a requirement of state law into the zoning code that's already addressed in the housing element. Um, so there is state law that if um, there are non-vacant sites that are identified um, in your housing element opportunity sites map. Um, and if those um, sites um, have existing residential uses that are eliminated as part of a redevelopment project, those eliminated units need to be replaced um, with new affordable units if those existing units are uh, rent restricted um, to a lower income household or, or occupied by um, a lower income household. Uh, and so this is, um, this is a, a requirement that's, that's potentially significant for a um, site um, identified in the housing element. Um, and we wanna make sure that it's not overlooked by future applicants, by future staff and planning commission who act on the application. So we want it to be very clear in the zoning code what this requirement is so that it's not overlooked. Here's a map in your housing element um, that shows all the opportunity sites. And here's a zoom in um, of the sites with an existing, uh, non-vacant sites with an existing residential use. And some of these sites have maybe just one unit that's part of a commercial property, but there's still a residential unit there. And if it were to be redeveloped, it would be subject to this replacement requirement. Um, and so what the code does is 
uh, in all of the uh, zoning district chapters uh, in the allowed use table, there's a um, reference to the um, replacement requirement. And then in the supplemental standards chapter, uh, there is language about this replacement requirement. And I think most importantly, specifying what, the, what an applicant needs to submit um, in order for staff to review the application and ensure that it complies with um, the replacement requirement as specified in state law. So most of that new text is saying, okay, um, if you're at one of these sites, here's the information that you need to submit um, to the city so that city can verify compliance with the requirement. Right. So you've got in section C1D income information that a landlord would have no way of getting. Right. And that's why there is the very important three words, if available. <laughs> yeah, except it's in... Uh, You have it somewhere else too, where you asked for income information. Because yeah. <laughs> I go like this, you're not going to get it. There you go. Um, it, yeah. So the reference I did, uh, C1D, actually um, occupied lower income housing earning 80 percent or less of the Santa Cruz County median uh, income. You that you won't have, you won't necessarily have that. You've got your if known as paragraph three. It's in there twice, effectively. Uh, yeah, I think we should probably add that in D as well. Yeah, or, or yeah, add it in D or get rid of D. I don't know. But yeah, I think care. D D is important stuff because you can't get. <laughs> city will need that information if known. Um, uh, and so I think we would need to ask for it, but we wouldn't want um, the property owner's inability to get that information to you also don't want the opposite. You don't want the, the uh, property owner sort of harassing their renters for information, right, in order to get the thing through. Harassing is probably the wrong word, but you know what I mean, right? right. You don't, yeah. you don't, we don't have, we don't want to have that come back and haunt us. <laughs> it, it seems like an opportunity to work with our city attorney to draft something that's correct, and it's optional uh, for the tenant to fill out. And, you know, this is what's going to make places like the Park Avenue property almost impossible to see any redevelopment take place on there, and it's such a wonderful site. Mm. It, it's a big burden <sighs> for the developer. Agreed. Julia? Right, parking. So this topic was previously discussed by the Planning Commission, and the direction from the commission was to reduce multifamily parking based on unit size and proximity to transit, um, to reduce parking required for special needs housing consistent with state law, revise parking for single family home remodels as required by state law, and then to revise parking for religious institution housing projects as required by state law. So in the amendments, um, uh, on packet page 99, that's the zoning code section, where there's the required parking spaces based on land use. And so um, you see on the screen here the proposed uh, reduction to the um, parking spaces required for multifamily dwellings. I think these numbers are consistent with what the Planning Commission reviewed previously. And then there are changes to special needs housing, so things like senior housing, group housing, and SROs, residential care facilities, emergency shelters, and much of this is required by state law. Single family dwellings, again, this is required by state law, um, where um, if there is an addition to an existing home, the city may not And then for religious institution affiliated housing developments, again, this is a state law requirement um, where 
if there is a housing project on a religious institution site, up to 50% of the existing uh, parking spaces that serve the religious use can be um, removed and not replaced. And then for the housing itself, um, uh, no more than one space per dwelling unit uh, and no parking um, required within one half mile walking distance of qualifying transit areas. It's all out of state law. So um, if you're interested in any planning commission questions uh, or comments about that. I had a question. Um, the the um, qualified transit, proximity to qualified transit, wondering if it was known if we were ever to have the qualified transit um, outpost that's anywhere in this vicinity within um, any projected multifamily housing. I, I know that it's not, I think our bus stops are not, they don't qualify because they're not within a certain time allowance of frequency. But um, I'm just wondering if that's ever a known projection for this city. <laughs> that is a goal, um, I think, from the Metro. And I, I do expect that we'll see that at the Capitola Mall, if the Capitola Mall is redeveloped, or um, I think they're estimating that it would happen within this planning period. So, um, good to know. yeah, I'm sorry I don't have the specifics. We could come back with that. But I, I do know that that is a goal of Metro, and we're seeing it. I think, um, I know in Watsonville, I believe they're at that number, and also in, in Santa Cruz. So we're kind of the in-between, and... I would expect that to happen in this planning period. And we're, we've committed to tracking that throughout this planning period and updating references within our zoning code once we become a qualified transit. That's good to hear. <laughs> and then so for the um, religious institution sites that could utilize the parking requirement um, under state law, those, are, those two sites are the churches um, on um, Monterey Avenue and um, it's hard to imagine that there would ever be um, bus service uh, in that location that would qualify that for the um, reduced parking. I have a question. Did you have a chance to evaluate the letter that came in on parking tables 1776-2? And do you have any analysis that uh, supports or refutes the request? Yeah, right. So, Chair, I don't know if this might be an opportunity to reopen the public comment. Yes. <laughs> we could open a public for public comment. At least we have a public. Yes. <laughs> Makes for more dynamic discussion. <laughs> um, so, we think your parking requirements are quite high, especially for multifamily. And... Um, just noting that you have three categories and that at 750 square feet, you require two parking units. Whereas if you're in a single family home and it's 1500 is when you require two. So I, I, it, it might, there might actually be an explanation for it, but I'm, it's just really confusing why you have three levels of parking requirements for multifamily and why the beginning point for two spaces per is so low, the square footage. And then just in general, we know that all the other jurisdictions do it by bedrooms, not by, not by um, square footage. And then just a minor, a minor point also, now I'm going into the detail of the letter, um, you had a pretty clear recommendation to not have any covered parking, and I noticed that in the draft there was still one covered under the single family. It was still in there, so that was just the third item that we had on parking. Thank you, Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you for coming. <laughs> okay, closing um, public comment and um, board deliberation. Do we have any thoughts? <laughs> So um, not having a chance to review this in great detail, but it seems um, pretty straightforward that at least the first bullet item, which is the 151 square feet, 
for two parking units does seem inconsistent. So perhaps if that should be changed to 150 plus to be consistent with single family uses. Um, curious to see how staff responds to that. I'm sorry, could you repeat that please? So the first bullet requiring two units, two units for over 751 square feet in a multifamily is quite high. As she then references single family uses being 150 or excuse me, 1,500 plus square feet uh, as the threshold. And so it would seem without deep analysis that that would be to, to raise the one 751 to 1,500 would be logical. But I, I have to admit, I haven't really delved into this. So under our single family dwellings, once you hit 15, it says 1,500 square feet or less requires two. Um, and then 1501 square feet or more requires still two units, one which is covered. So regardless, any single family development will require two. Just that threshold of 1500 is to add one more, add the covered space. Um, okay. But under, uh, up here on the multifamily, um, we were saying once you get to 750 square feet, that's kind of the threshold for two spaces. Um, that doesn't even make sense. How do you have a multifamily unit that's only 751 square feet? I don't know. Yeah, the actual unit itself is 751 square feet, so each unit is the, ah, the measurement. Yeah. I say that's a, one, a one unit. tiny little lot. But, um, also, with um, I think our ADU ordinance, right? We 800, 850 would require one parking spot within the coastal zone. That's, so, um, I mean, I do see your point. When, when two, two parking spaces per 750 square foot unit seems does seem high, I guess. Yeah, we um, at our last meeting that we talked about this, we looked at what other jurisdictions mm -hmm. are doing now at least and we visited that um, the in uh, Scotts Valley two per unit Dove County two per unit Boulder and Sandy and so a lot of things that were the entirety of Watsonville And that's what they have now existing. Many of those jurisdictions, I think, intend to lower their requirements and have housing element for one person. Scotts Valley is one of them. Um, uh, and you know, I think the city of Santa Cruz has ambitions to completely eliminate required units at all in certain areas. So you know, I think that on the screen here is what's in the draft and what you looked at previously, two per unit. Two, two per unit for a unit that's 750 square feet or more. Um, so think of that as a one bedroom. You know, it's less parking than currently required, but there are some projects where that could be a constraint, especially as you're getting into 30, 40 or more dwelling units per acre with structured parking that becomes very, very expensive. It is possible that that standard could become a constraint. Um, there are pathways to overcome that, such as util utilizing state density bonus law, which through which the city can require no more than one parking space per unit. So, I mean, I think that, um, that, there, that as proposed, the parking has been reduced from what it currently is. It could be reduced more, um, depending on how aggressive the city wants to be on the parking. And there are other pathways for reduced projects that utilize state density bonus law. And then on the square feet versus units, personally, I'm agnostic on the issue. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's hard to identify exactly what's a unit and what's not. Square footage is a little bit more yeah. straightforward. But 
Other jurisdictions use bedrooms, and state law also uses bedrooms as well. Or, I'm sorry, other jurisdictions use bedrooms, yes, and state law uses bedrooms, at least for state density bonus purposes. So there might be a, an argument to use bedrooms as well instead of square feet, as we've done. So I'm not uh, advocating. Um, well, yeah, thinking about this, I guess, um, you know, there there has been a lot of feedback over the years about how little parking there is, and for us to say, let's reduce parking even more than we need, um, I'm kind of reluctant to do that. I think you have to look at where you are and where Capitola is, and we don't have, uh, you know, a great public transit system at this point, and so... You know, people people are going to end up having cars, and we have parking problems now in most of the areas of town. So, uh, you know, it's a hard balance to come up with, and we are uh, significantly reducing the amount of parking that we have required in the past. And what we have seen, you know, with the uh, projects that come in that have an affordable component to them. They are able to use the state density bonus to, you know, reduce the amount of parking on those sites. So, um, you know, I'm I'm pretty comfortable with where we have gotten to, uh, which I think was a big step and an important step. But, um, you know, we have we have to look at our community as well, and um, where where are we going to put in the quality of life for the people who are going to live in these units, you know, because uh, people unfortunately do have to have cars to live in our area. Maybe 20 years from now, we'll be in a better situation to not have that, but we're not now. I, I, I would agree with that. We're not, we're not quite to the Santa Cruz, you know, urbanization level. And they, they have they're much more of a city than we are. We're, we're you know, more of a suburban community, I think. And we don't have good bike paths either, by the way. I think you can tell them. We just don't. It's, yeah. it's dangerous as it is. I mean, if this rail-to-trail thing goes through, it's going to even be worse. So I'm not going down that path tonight. Um, I, I think we have – I would leave it the way you've written, and I think it's – I would like some clarification on one item. Um, my memory, I'm, I'm not 100% sure it's correct, but and then I'm noticing that within this letter, Yimby raises the question about the one covered parking space. Is um, previously, is, was that the direction of Planning Commission that once we get to a certain amount, 1,500 square feet, there should be a one covered parking space associated with this single family home? Because my memory was that we said we no longer I don't think want to include covered parking. I, I remember talking about it. I think we eliminated it because garages don't, garages count towards overall square footage of homes. And so, right? Is that, I think that was part of the what I recall. If it's but uncovered, if it's covered, it just becomes a storage room. Yeah, or, you know, your brother sleeps or something like that. Sorry, okay. Um, okay, so, so is for that single concept? family dwellings, two per unit, no covered, regardless of parking. That's what I recall. Okay. Yeah. I do have an uh, interesting question. You're, you've added uh, the last category here under residential, under, it's called all other age restricted senior housing, and then it excludes long term care and all that kind of stuff. What is the intent of that? Um, so, I mean, I'm not sure what that is. Is that like these Disneyland resort things? So wouldn't that, wouldn't that be like a age restricted like mobile home park or something like that? Over or um, condo? I should let him answer the question, shouldn't I? I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Yeah, so I think I have no idea what that is. This, what's up on the table maybe explains this better. So if you're, um, uh, you know, in, in an age-restricted senior housing development um, that's independent living with no sort of services, not assisted living type, or long-term care type facility, then it's 1.5 per unit. Um, but for these other types of senior housing, um, 
such as assisted living, long-term care, where there's more of a um, medical care component to the residential arrangement, then um, we would stay with the existing standard of one parking space per six. So as an example, what's the Bay one? Avenue apartment? the Bay Avenue one? Is Bay Avenue is uh, age restricted, so 55 and above. And that would fall under this because it's not um, tied to a specific like disability or other it's or independent income. Living. Yeah. Okay. It's independent living. Mm -hmm. Independent. what the developers would think about that. That's what they utilized at um, Fort, uh, the housing that just broke ground on Fort 401 Capitol yeah. Road. Yeah. That's they were 1.5. I think unit. at least that's what I remember. Yeah. I think that's a fairly standard yeah. amount of housing. Okay. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Okay. So, um, I have a presentation that kind of describes, provides a definition of all these different types of special needs housing with um, some information on the amendments to the zoning code as required by state law for these types of housing. I guess a question for the commission is, do you want me to go through, given the hour that we are now, do you want more information about what these different special needs housing uses are, um, or um, do you want to just, or do you want an abbreviated presentation? Abbreviated. Time, abbreviated. I think they're pretty understandable. Okay. All right. And so, you know, I guess I would say that there are the programs and the housing element that call for these specific amendments to special needs housing. This is all driven by state law. Um, and I think that there's really no flexibility in what the city um, has to do on this. There's maybe different ways that it can be implemented in the zoning code in terms of the, you know, where in the zoning code it appears. But in terms of like the underlying rule, there's, there's no discretion. Um, and so, you know, I would say that if you have any questions about, um, I'll go back to the list. If you have any questions for us about these amendments in the code related to these types of housing, you can answer, answer those questions. Yeah, you. I had a couple. So on the employee housing, maybe it's a state law, I'm not sure, but you have it listed as um, six or fewer people in the residence. Did you, is that just a copy from, uh, why the number six, not yeah. 10 or four or what? So in, for, a, for a single family dwelling, if there are six employees in a single family dwelling, um, it has to be treated, it has to be regulated in the same way as if um, a different type of housing resided. It, regulated by, is that the state law? Yes. Okay, so that's your rationale. And then, um, we've eliminated large residential care facilities sort of as a category, like carte blanche. There must be a rationale for that, too. It's been eliminated in several places. Right. So, um, let's see. Residential care facilities are regulated by state law now, right? I believe we're, um, the requirement was kind of to take away the difference between small and large and make them all consistent with state law. So that's. So Um, residential zoning districts, you, you still have the small and the large in terms of the zoning code provisions. Same in the mixed use. I think the, 
maybe, Commissioner, I see what you're referring to is the removal of the section with the standard for large residential care facilities. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah, right. Great. So um, that has been re removed, and so it's section 1794.08a in the zoning code, and it's on the third page of the packet. And most of those standards are simply references to other standards within the code that you must fall must comply with. So there's really no need to repeat those. And there's also in the statement that you have to have something that's not within the city, that's within the state. So I think we found that these uh, existing large residential care facilities were, were not really necessary, um, didn't really have any continued utility for the city, and therefore they must be eliminated. Yeah, okay, that, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. So, however, then in the glossary, you, you still reference it under residential care facility, large and small? Yeah, there's still, there's still different uses. Um, it's just that large residential care facilities um, no longer have these uh, standards that are specific to okay. them. Okay. All right. And so um, we also wanted to make sure that if planning commissioners have any other comments about the preliminary draft zoning code amendment beyond what we've already talked about? We want to make sure that we receive your comments tonight so that if there's any questions or there's any changes to the amendment, we can bring them up to the board. So now would be now would be the time um, for you to share those comments. And Ben, can you clarify what the, the three remaining topics are? so that we don't duplicate one um, one is right yeah so also um uh, we're going to talk about flat work we're going to talk about retail cannabis establishments and office space restrictions in um, oh i think i zone. can help you out on the flat work one i i was the one who brought that up because i have a concern about several of our neighborhoods that don't have any kind of storm drain systems in them and we continue to add, you know, impervious surface. We don't keep track of it because there's no permit or anything required. And um, I have learned from another jurisdiction that you don't want to require a permit for flat work or you get yourself in a case where you have to report that to the state every year because there's a mandate for doing that and you might even force the homeowner to have to do a stormwater management plan to put that in. So I would like to abandon the idea of having permits and standards for flat work. Because I think it will just create a huge burden for the homeowner that we really don't want to create for them. Just as a matter of order, can uh -huh. we finish your table show because there's some I had some other questions about you the table that you put in here which you haven't gone through yet I was just commenting on the slide that was up oh, there no. before we get to new stuff can we finish the old stuff the list of the table the, yeah so you have one with the list of as an example on my page uh, um, 13 you state Opaque windows on second stories, and then you refer to 1716, da, 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 uh, I think it's 030B11D. And that is, that's referring to, I guess we put a criteria in for decks to throw something opaque in there on a deck that's adjacent to an interior side yard. It does not talk about opaque windows on second stories or first stories looking at that we intended to talk about in that line. It's a top row on the table on page 13. 13 being the number on the lower right. <laughs> no, my 13 is. Yeah. <laughs> my 13 is that's the. Well, actually, it's 
<laughs> so, right. Is it on the I table? Want, whatever page it on, that line. <laughs> okay. I don't have a top one. Oh, I thought that clarified that there's no requirement for opaque windows. It's simply up to the planning commission or if a neighbor agrees to do it as they've talked to each other and they agreed to do it. It says, it says opaque windows may be required by the planning commission on a case-by-case -case basis but are not always required. Right, but the... But the Particular reference is to X, Second not to anything about. else. So we're we're un, we're unclear, or we leave it open, I guess, as to where opaque windows are required in any design. I don't know if we intended to be or not. And we, I remember on that ADU on Escalona, we decided we one of the conditional conditions was to put opaque windows in, and we took it out. Yeah, I think the only place the opaque windows are stated are within the objective standards for ADUs. Correct. So would the, I guess we could, would the Planning Commission like to see standards for opaque windows on second stories of single family homes? No, I don't think so. Okay, well, we'll scratch that from the list. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, and then, um, so our, <laughs> farther down on the same page, upper floor decks, uh, do we want to address the other letter that came in from Valerie Hart? Right. Isn't that on our topic? We're going to discuss that next. We, we did not have a plan to discuss upper floor decks. Okay. We should we discuss. <laughs> <laughs> That letter was, I thought it was good, although it, the math confused me, so I couldn't follow it. Yeah, I couldn't follow the math on it either. But she did imply that we're a little bit inconsistent with uh, how you would design a first floor with a deck on top. Right, and I did think her comment that we needed to change our wording about on a corner lot, you know, the exterior one, that, that seemed to make real good sense to me too. But... Um, I don't know if we really want to talk about. I don't know if we're all prepared to talk about. We that could we could bring that back. If there if there is specific items you're concerned about though with the decks, that would be helpful. I think the direction we got previously was that it was going to be a, a cumulative. Um, the 150 square feet we would add between the different decks on a home, but if there's certain things you'd like us, if anyone has any input on the second story decks and a direction they'd like to see, that'd be helpful for when we come back or we can just bring it as a topic at the next hearing. So I think as a minimum, we agree with her comment about interior versus exterior side yards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that should be addressed. Um, I would love to talk about second story decks if I thought I could get any traction, but I don't think I can. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've beaten it to death. <laughs> I just think they're so important. I'm sorry. Well, her, her item number three, six, six foot maximum distance, and then she goes through the math. That 25% uh, rear yard setback further complicates matters, potentially necessitating additional roofing over the first floor. That would worry me if that were a true statement. The next statement is, if it's six foot deep, it's got to be 25 feet long to get to 150 feet, which seems a little silly. So are we over-specifying decks on the second floor? Yes. I think that's, and Sean and I had a brief discussion about that, so I think maybe we, we should bring that up at the next hearing. Okay. Some of the, to go through some of this math. Uh, I, I may be able to are some of what that that letter is directed towards. I, I think that paragraph right above the square footage is uh, referring to the limitation on deck projection. There's a standard in our, in our current code that limits that to six feet. So I, I think that ties to both her comment about the, the difficulty in reaching the cumulative 
square footage allowed with uh, under an exemption, as well as uh, the limit, uh, how they refer to the, uh, let's see here, uh, the inability to uh, have a deck sitting on top of a lower story area. I think that was, I think they're actually saying that that they are limited by how much they can project, regardless of how much, if, if it's all on top of a first story, because they can only go out six feet, no matter how far that first story goes out. So if you have a mm. ground level come out 10 feet further than the upper story, you couldn't go out all the way. So I think that's the comment. And our, the way we've read the standards as they are is that it doesn't really matter. If you're, it, we measure from the, the upper story edge of wall, so that how far that comes out six feet, that's the cap. So it seems like if we want to talk about it, we should talk about it next time and, you know, have some examples that we can actually look at and have a bit more of a thoughtful discussion rather than just wing it tonight. Yep, <laughs> agree. One last thing. Speaking of decks, somewhere in this thing, you, we eliminated uh, decks on roofs. Anybody remember that? Mm -hmm. For the front of a home, hmm? I, I believe it was for the front of a home, we would allow the second story deck. To... No, roof decks have always been. Oh, roof decks. Yeah, we eliminated them on it's, uh, it's single not... family homes. That's not new. Well, the, there are some red lines to take out in this particular version. I just wanted to make sure we're all yeah. making clear with that. Maybe, maybe you're referring to the design permits chapter where rooftop decks is removed from the list of projects requiring a design permit for single family homes. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, and that was eliminated because roof decks for um, single family homes are not have one quick question maybe you can probably should have asked staff this ahead of time but uh, on the ADU uh, table 1774-1 uh, which is uh, page 121 on my handout or page 91 with the square box uh, it just talks about the maximum height there's a there's a new red line of being 18 feet allowed for detached accessory dwelling I can't remember where we came up with that number. It's usually, it used to be 16. That is, you're talking about ADU height? ADU heights. Yeah. Has changed, recent changes to state. Very good. Um, I was wondering if I could bring up one thing. I didn't, I don't think I've broached the subject to staff before, but um, talking about the number of required parking spaces for businesses, for re retail, restaurants, stuff like that in the village area. I was wondering if we could explore a couple things with that, mainly with just the introduction of um, outdoor dining and all this stuff. This is not really, this is pretty off topic, but I just in reading through it, I thought maybe it'd be an interesting discussion topic just because I feel like there's a lot of things that contradict each other. <laughs> And in the so past, we want to do that as part of this and try and get this sure. stay with our schedule. Yeah, no, definitely. I just was wondering if at some point we could ever incorporate that into a discussion if we're talking about amendments. Sure. And is there um, a general? I I just was. I I feel um, with the introduction of new retail establishments, um, possible, you know. The, the little beer bar that went in down in the village, having um, strict requirements for the number of seats um, they're allowed based on parking. It just the relationship seemed obscure at this point. So I just I just wanted to explore. But if not, that's not a so big a, a discussion on the village, but kind of after the housing element. Is gone. Yes, yes, okay. of course. But I he was then suggested we talk about different things. So <laughs> that, it was a little off topic. Apologies. So if we were talking about different things, can I throw one in? <laughs> so we, we had a comment here about um, um, a letter that came in with regards to um, all of the 
uh, uh, public access issues in the village, um, the signage, all the violations. I know you did a sweep just recently, and so you found a lot of violations. Um, I know that uh, having watched these meetings and the city council meetings for a long, long time, that the main issue has always been pedestrian traffic. And so we actually changed our sign ordinance to make the signs very easy to walk around. So there's a, there's a consistent sign that we all use, and et cetera, et cetera. So my uh, interest, I guess, would be to uh, have a review of that based on this, this letter uh, to see if we are, in fact, uh, overreaching in some areas, like, you know, not allowed to hang clothes on a, on a, outside your house. I'm not sure where that came from. It would be nice just to have a quick review of um, what are the ordinances and if there's an opportunity to refine those. Um, if, if nothing, I could even, I'd be actually interested to do that just with staff on the sidebar if, if that's appropriate. But if anybody else is interested, I, I'd like to go over that again. I would just recommend if that was going to happen that maybe, maybe I some of the VIA members be included in that. I mean, so that as we review it and then see how things have changed, you know, from a standpoint of business. So I, if we did go down that road, I'd want to make sure that it wasn't just decided at this level of input from members. Right. And I, I think, you know, one of the things about a zoning ordinance is it's not written and done and never gets changed. And a lot of topics like these are ones that definitely should come up in the future. So there's sort of a constant review because the standards and things do change. I mean, look at the Capitola Mall. It's certainly different than it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So I think that's good. But I do think, you know, at this point, we, we can't take on everything or we're never going to get this zoning amendment done and adopted, it's like we're sort of on a path, and I'd like to see us finish that path. Um, you know, as Commissioner Esty said, let's finish what we're doing now before we take on a bunch of new stuff. I agree with that. I just don't want to, I just don't want to lose, right. lose it as a topic eventually. So we typically, we start a new list, and I think we're starting a new list tonight for the 2025 zoning code update. And I already have a two-year contract with Ben Noble so <laughs> of, of next year's cleanups. So I have village parking on that and uh, items related to the village sweep. Okay. Well, maybe, oh, sorry. I can just give you a number. Um, I think that uh, in the ordinance on residential development, there's a section about mini bar and convenience areas that could completely go away. That's left over from when we had single family houses could only have one kitchen. And so there was, you know, a big thing that people couldn't have two kitchens in a house. And this is this this is left over from that. So you can put that on your list. Just eliminate it. And just following up with I mean I think Commissioner's well um, comment was important, but at the same time, do you think there can be some communication back regarding, you know, I look at this when we send in a letter, have some communication that we've identified it, it was heard by the Planning Commission, and we're slating it. Our calendar this year is full, we're slating it for 2025 as a calendar. And so there's comments back to the, to the person that sent in the email and maybe to the BIA so that they know that it's being calendar for an upcoming topic in the future. Didn't check in. Nope. Moving on. All right. So we've uh, crossed flat work off of the list, I believe. So we can talk about retail cannabis establishments. So um, currently in the code, retail cannabis is allowed only in the CR zone. So uh, Mall, Capitola, or 41st Avenue, north of Capitola Road, with a maximum of two establishments allowed citywide. Uh, and so um, uh, cannabis retail, retail cannabis establishment 
owners have pointed out that the CR zone limitation is challenging due to existing prohibitions on retail cannabis in multi-tenant commercial leases. The staff would like planning commission feedback on whether the city should expand the allowable locations for retail cannabis establishments to include properties in the community commercial CC zone, which front 41st Avenue South. And I'm just going to chime in with two examples, uh, two sites that do not, due to their lease, allow retail cannabis or one, the Capitola Mall, the other is Brown's Ranch. That's a huge portion of our regional commercial. So it's when the two licenses got issued and they had, I think, six months to find a retail shop, it was extremely challenging. So um, this would just open it up for the same maximum, too, but if one of the locations, the apothecarium is now closed. There's a new um, entity taking over that lease. Um, but should they want to move, they could also look south of Capitola Road, is the question we're asking here. So can I suggest something other than changing the zones? But I, I think we should just treat cannabis as the same as hard liquor or spirits. All the laws and restrictions that require selling bourbon or whiskey or any other hard liquor should be the same as uh, for cannabis. And so, you know, what, whatever falls out from that determines where they are. In what respect, Lou? Uh, well, I think this is an item that ought to go to the city council because they are the ones who set up the standard of only having two in Capitola and the standard of where they're going to be located. So it seems like it's up to them to direct us to make a change if they've sort of changed their policy because there was a fair amount of public comment and discussion about it when it was adopted. I would suggest that if there's support for at least expanding uh, down 41st Avenue, that Planning Commission, if there's support for at least that, that we'd be allowed to take that recommendation to the City Council, just so we don't have a, a major modification that we would have to come back that's, um, if you're open to that. I, I do hear you. The, plan, the City Council set up all the standards for this, the exact, we, we drafted new language in the code, and that is what it follows. This is just something that we've heard from the cannabis establishments of how challenging finding a location in Capitola has been. So it's, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with expanding it down. Yeah, I don't have a problem. That's the easiest way to make this work. As long as they have to come with their, they, they have their application, they come in, they tell us what it's going to look like and everything. Yeah, they would need a conditional use permit for any location. So that, yeah. yeah. And so the last topic for tonight on our list is office space in commercial districts. And so I remember when the zoning code <laughs> update was prepared and, um, and adopted in 2020, there was a lot of discussion about this and where the city uh, ultimately landed um, was to prohibit ground floor office in the CR zoning district with the idea that existing ground floor commercial spaces need to be um, reserved for retail and personal services and similar sort of customer oriented uses that will generate so that was the uh, that's what's in the zoning code now, um, and the issue is that um, there's concern about vacant ground floor space in the CR zone, um, as well as interest in office uses uses in occupying that vacant space, which they can't do because of the um, ground floor office prohibition in the CR zoning district. Um, and so staff suggestion and uh, interested in planning commission feedback on is to um, allow ground floor office in the CR in certain circumstances. And it might be for 
buildings without entry doors oriented to the street frontage or buildings without frontage on 41st Avenue or Clare Street. So examples might be um, these three properties that are shown on the screen here, 2045 40th, 20, 2001 40th Avenue and 4170 Gross Road. Um, here are some images that show these buildings um, that might have criteria that would make them suitable for ground floor office uses. And so I think what we're asking um, from the Planning Commission tonight is feedback on whether ground floor office should be allowed in certain circumstances in the CR zone. And if so, what those circumstances should be. Um, examples are buildings without entry doors oriented to the street, buildings without frontage on 41st Avenue or Clare Street, or um, other circumstances. Can you? My recollection is this all came about when there was this great fear that medical offices in particular uh, were going to take over you know, the vacant spaces at 41st Avenue and the financial impact they were going to have on the city by not having retail be the main use up there. Um, and um, so I definitely think we need to do some, you know, modification. Um, I guess I'm a little confused about maybe even what our definition is about office use. Um, uh, because um, uh, the one applicant that I'm aware of who tried to go in uh, was taking over a salon that had been a hair establishment and was going to put a business, uh, a financial business in there where they would have customers coming and going during the day. Um, but, you know, it didn't quite meet our definition. So I, I would like to see something done to allow those buildings like that to uh, have more opportunity to rent their space. Well, I think also that space next door is the recruiting office, correct? Right, Army so, Recruiting yeah, Office. Yeah, it's a recruiting office that has people come and go and doing right. paperwork. And then, yeah, so I, I would think I'd want to be sensitive to also what are the other uses that are already going next to it and that might be under different. Yeah. So isn't the original argument though is would be sales tax you'd want the original sales argument, tax it's so all about sales tax it's, it's not whether or not people are coming and going it's whether or not we're gathering sales tax from those so we allow other uses like a hair salon i don't believe hair salons pay sales tax uh, we allow dentist you know i mean we we've allowed well, insurance agents and yeah so so I don't know what you know precedents are, but I I agree that we should help them you know try to get tenants. Um, yeah. But I also understand the, the the need for sales tax. So I mean something like buildings without frontage on Forty First Street or Clear Street might be a good. Yeah, I think there's um, and I'm sorry I didn't put this in the staff report. I'm going to see if I can switch it to my. There's one other standard in the code for existing office uses, which I think we could approve upon, and it would have really helped in the review of the financial. Um, I'm going to read this to you. Uh, it's two sentences. But within office buildings utilized exclusively for office use as of June 9th, 2021, offices may continue to occupy the ground floor tenant space. Within such office buildings, a new tenant is not subject to the permit requirements of the table until such time that the building is redeveloped or all the office space in the ground floor level is converted to non-office use. So that, that, that's a placeholder for the office spaces that are there. Um, the one that was challenging was um, new office uses. So it says in the CC and CR zoning districts, Permits required for new office uses and conversions of non-office spaces to office have to comply with the table. Offices, including professional medical financial institutions and government. I'm sorry, I'm not finding the... 
there there was one part of the wording here could be improved to allow if there's a multi office building with multiple offices such as the one on the corner of Claire's and 40th that we could allow a salon if there's still another office space within that building to allow another a conversion to another office because it's pretty impractical to think that many of these office buildings were established as office buildings and are set up as office buildings and one by one if they if they haven't had an office space in there for I think it's six months then they they lose that use and they can't be refilled as um, an office that then has to become commercial so unless it's an entire building so I think we can rework some of the existing language to be more favorable for um, existing office buildings to retenant their spaces. I think that's one issue that we're seeing for both of those buildings on 40th. Um, and then we can also create some criteria if, if that works. If the, if the fear was um, like a, a health, you know, a health facility takeover, what could we just make it a caveat that they couldn't have health facilities? I mean, I know it's the sales tax issue, but I mean, we, it seems it would, it just seems kind of crazy that they're going to that we're going to hold the, um, the building owners hostage when it's hard to rent in general office space or uh, commercial spaces is rising. But I think they're going in the right direction by looking at the association and saying, look, should we start and say these should be? Because uh, there is a legitimate argument about the sales tax. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what the city relies on. That's where it gets its revenue and its income. And, uh, you know, there there was a talk at, at, I think, around this same time, you know, about a medical facility taking over a major store in the mall. And, um, uh, you know, those, those would be a concern to the city. And I think the city does have to try and make certain that Revenue generating space stays there. So, but something like this would work real well, I think. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, and also with the drive, you know, uh, when you hear the term, you know, everybody wants a 15 minute city and stuff like that, I think there needs to be flexibility so that, you know, we, we don't have just vacant space that's not getting anything. Mm -hmm. If we could have an office building that stayed in Capitol and, and employed people and mm -hmm. kept people off traffic and maybe use transit or use a bike, it would be good. So, <laughs> I, I like where you're going with that. I would agree. So your your uh, administrative changes to your to your wording, would that cover most of the complaints that you're getting? I, I think so. It would build in some exceptions and in key areas, as well as certain scenarios within buildings that already have office. So, do we, so would you, do we need to add the, any of these three bullets then? I think we need to... Um, also modify the existing office use section to allow if an office has moved out and it's been more than six months they still have the opportunity to refill retenant that space within a multi-tenant office space that makes sense to me um but again that's not that's neither of these bullets correct yeah this is something that like doing both right? do, doing both we'll, we'll go a step further and we, we look at our existing office space and um, making sure that people can retenant their office space on the first floor if it's historically been office space and not fully redeveloped. There's just a, a lot of offices such as like the Housing Authority on 40, 41st Avenue and um, the two buildings we just looked at. So yeah. we're trying to keep that prime commercial at the same time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So when we do have, um, I think, an informational item regarding accessory dwelling, information. Yeah, so this is uh, just two points of one thing, just to reiterate that ADU amendments are are part of this cleanup, uh, largely like a lot of the other sections to keep up with state legislation. Uh, there's a number of laws that actually go back, I think, even of 
over a year ago that we are um, endeavoring to comply with. Uh, the other part of that is that we have had some very recent conversations internally as well as with our, our city council uh, regarding the processing of, of applications, both theoretical and some that are actually in the works right now, and how that plays with, um, excuse me, uh, within the coastal zone. Previously, uh, the city's interpretation has been that if it's within the coastal area, that even if the city's uh, zoning provisions are not compliant with housing law, that they would still take precedence provided it was a part of a certified LCP. We're hearing that that might not be entirely true with uh, specifically with ADUs uh, anymore. There have been some recent court decisions uh, and new interpretations that apply. So we may be bringing forward in the near future one or more applications for ADUs that don't necessarily meet all of the city's ADU development standards, but do comply with state ADU laws, and it is a, an evolving interpretation that we we should process them uh, as something that is approvable because they are compliant with uh, state law and they do not conflict with the Coastal Act or, or coast policies or coastal resources. So we wanted to make that uh, make you aware of that uh, standalone of any actual specific application. This is kind of at least internally a, a big change. In, in perspective, so we're keeping you in the loop there. You're not talking about a specific project, but like, um, what's the example of something that you're looking at? An example could be when a ADU could qualify for what we refer to as the guaranteed allowance, so when they're able to exceed the maximum floor area ratio. Right now we have our, what we call our limited standards for four feet rear side, than the max height. Um, the state has since passed more permissive and, and flexible standards regarding height and setbacks uh, that may compel us to allow that, that exemption from FAR or that, that uh, exceeding FAR to apply to a wider variety of ADU permutations as an example. And our thinking was even if that was the case, we would need to wait for our zoning code to be updated within the coastal zone for that to be applicable and whereas outside the coastal zone it it would be applicable today we're now thinking that that would largely be applicable regardless thank you anything else okay so just to recap where we are um, we have completed any commission study session number five and so Housing element recommendation, August 8th. Um, and then the Planning Commission will have um, uh, another meeting August 15th for the zoning code amendments, which will include everything except for mall site. Mall site. Um, that will be on August 15th. And then um, August 29th. Planning Commission meeting uh, on for the amendments for mall site. All amendments for mall site. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think that's all taken care of. Okay. Um, moving on to item six, this is the director's report. If you have any. Um. I, I don't have much in terms of a director's report tonight. I really appreciate all the thoughtful comments this evening and helping and taking the time for two and a half hours to get us to that next step. And I feel like we're on track. And again, uh, very much appreciate public comment tonight and uh, Ben's work on the zoning code update as well as Sean. So I think they're just working hard at this and we're we really appreciate all the comments tonight and look forward to the next meeting. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so that item seven, we're adjourned and we're adjourned to the next special meeting of the Planning Commission on August 8th at 2024 at 5 p.m. Thank you.